And in the Bohr model, I think I call them orbitals, and I'm just getting ahead of myself. The Bohr model, what's the Bohr model look like? I drew a sketch of it for you the other day. If you were going to draw it, what would it look like? like yeah, kind of like a target, right? And it would be like a dot in the middle. That's your nucleus. And then around there. Yeah, they call them, Bohr actually called them orbits, concentric circles. That's not exactly concentric. You know what, do you know what I see in everything I draw like that? I see like faces everywhere. <laughs> I know it's bizarre, but okay. <clears throat> so, so Bohr models had orbits. This is the nucleus. And what Bohr models said was that the electrons can only travel in these orbits. No, that's Planck. Yeah, yeah. Close, though. Close. He heated up elements and saw... Uh, I'll talk about it. And the guy who did that before him was the guy who discovered all the noble gases. Uh, a guy in uh, University College London, uh, Ramsey. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, helium got its name because when he isolated this gas that it actually came off a radioactive material that when he electrified it, it gave off a yellow light. And when they looked at the yellow light, it looked just like the light that came from the sun. So they called it helium after helios, which is the sun. So that's where it gets its name, yeah. Yeah, a whole long story with that. University College London is kind of a cool place too. If you, if you ever go to England, you want to be a real science nerd, I'll tell you where to go. If you want to just have fun, I'll tell you that too. But. I've only been there a couple of times, but it's a great place. Um, okay, so electrons can only travel in these orbits. So let's say you have an electron, it's down here, and it's going around and around and around, just like the planets go around uh, the sun. I was going to say the sun goes around the earth, but I thought, well, whatever. <laughs> to make you guys think a little bit, right? Sun does not go around the earth. Like the, like the planets go around the sun, if I put some energy in there, the internet is really slow. If I put a little energy in there, what happens is that electron absorbs that energy and then moves away from the nucleus. Okay? So it's kind of like this. Right, so here's a Here's my electron, right? And I put energy into it, like maybe I hit the table, and then it shoots up, it absorbs that energy. You know it takes energy because you got to, when you lift it, right? You gotta put work into this to lift it up. The same thing is true about the electron around the nucleus, because the nucleus has got a positive charge, and the electron's got a negative charge, and so if you're gonna move it away, it's gonna take energy. There's lots of ways you can do this. You can hit it, you can heat it, you can use electricity. In lab today, we'll use electricity. Some of you guys already saw we use 5,000 volts and we make things glow that way, okay? What you're doing is you're driving the electron from where it is to a higher orbit. And then it continues to go around in a circle, like that's the Bohr model, it continues to just go around like it does and then eventually, like all things that have high energy, they got to come back down, okay? And when they come down, they have to release that energy. So you get an electron. The first step is to put it up here. It's moving around. And at some point later, it drops. It goes from here, let's say, to, to here. Or it could also go from there to, like, there. It doesn't really matter. But here's the thing. Because of the orbit structure of the electrons around the nucleus, the amount of energy that came out was always fixed. A certain amount of energy would always come out. 
we get that out, and I'm going to do it like that. We get that out, and we see it as light. So if you look at light, and you separate it out by its wavelength, right? So think about, I'll draw it up here. You have a prism. And then light comes in, and then it comes out like this, right? And we go like this, Roy, G, Biv. This is going to be a rainbow, right? It's not really a rainbow. It's called a color spectrum. But it looks like a rainbow, because that's what a rainbow is. It's just a color spectrum, the light from the sun. Okay. So since... Only certain energies come out as the electrons go down from high to low, right? When you look at elements, some of those will be missing. And all you see is lines from the light as you put it through a prism. Okay? So that's what you'll see in the lab today, when, or some of you already saw it. When you hold, it's not a prism, it's called a diffraction grating, but pretend it's a prism. You hold it up to your eye and you look at the light, you're only going to see certain lines. And the reason for that is when the electrons are in their high energy state, the 5,000 volts puts them in their high energy state. They could be anywhere up here. I didn't draw them all. There's many, many of these things. They fall from these higher orbits to the lower ones, and when they do that, they give off light but only certain colors of light will be visible in the spectrum. Okay? Any questions? Do they ever go the other way? Like, instead of going out, do they ever go in, taking energy to go in? Well, so, so that's what's happening here, where they're going from high energy to low energy. So they're going from out to in, so they have to release the energy. But they already went out. I mean from the beginning. Because, like, if you take two... Two magnets, and you put two positives together. Uh huh. Repel. You're right, right, right. And it takes energy to push them together. So, is there a, there a case where, from their natural state, you could force them to get? To Not usually. I don't think you can do that because there's too much repulsive force and other like quantum mechanical things. It doesn't allow. So, there's only for each orbit, there's only a fixed number of electrons that'll fit. And in the essence, if you want to think about it like this, the smaller, the closer you are, the fewer you can fit. And the further away you are, the more you can fit because all these negative charges have to be spaced out around the nucleus. Okay? And if you, if you have too many negative charges, they just go into the next energy level. So we, we refer to these orbits as energy levels. And this is all stuff that Bohr's model does just fine. Okay? So I'm explaining to you the stuff that works. Um, and we usually give it the symbol n. And n goes from like 1, 2, 3. And 1 is the closest. That's the lowest energy. 2 is the next closest. 3 is the next closest. Okay? Here, here's the thing. Bohr's model, let me show you some pictures here. Um, so, so this is the idea. This is the thing that we used in, we used in the lab today. This is a hydrogen lamp. Hydrogen, the light comes through a slit. It goes through a prism, and then you only get like four lines out. So if you looked at the sun, which you're not supposed to do, but if you did, you'd see a rainbow. Okay. If you look at a, a light bulb, like an incandescent, not, not the new ones, not these fluorescent lights, okay. but the, the old ones that have the little wire in them that get hot, you see a rainbow from those too. Okay. So... That's what's called a continuous spectrum. This is known as a line spectrum. Why do they call it a line spectrum? Because it looks like a bunch of lines, yeah, that's all. And this is also known as an emission spectrum because it's the light emitted from the hydrogen lamp. Okay? So you see these lines. This is all that you see. So what this tells me, what we're seeing, okay, I'm seeing a red transition, uh, blue, indigo, you know, violet, trans violet transition. Um, the highest energy transition is this one. Now, how do I know that's the highest energy transition? 
it's the highest frequency of the light. It's the blue light has the highest energy, and this is the lowest energy transition. So this is actually the light emitted from a transition, it turns out, at the lowest energy levels of the hydrogen. It goes from the lowest, second lowest to the lowest, basically. This one's from one of the higher ones. In fact, it's actually one, two, it's three levels higher than this one is, and it drops back down to a lower level. More yeah, this, this electron absorbed more energy to get to this place, and then when it came back down, it released more light, a higher energy how light. How many it drops, how many peels it drops? You had on that other picture a short arrow and a long arrow from, we'll say, the fourth or fifth orbital, and you said it was the same thing? It gives off the same light because it's up the fifth hey, No, 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 so, so hang on, hang on. doesn't give off. So let me draw it like this. This is another way to. So let's pretend that the nucleus is down here. And this is one orbital, this is another one. Oh, sorry, i got to do it again. This is uh, trying to get this right here. There's not quite enough space to do this, but we'll do it like this. So these are, this is the curves of the orbits, okay? For this light here, okay, it, it, let's say it started up here, and then it dropped all the way down to here. Okay. And that's what gave us the light. For this light here, it started here and dropped all the way down to here. That's a different yeah. color. Yeah, different color because it's a different energy. Different energy level. Okay, so here's the deal. And this one came from this one and this one came from this one. And you're going to say, well, what about from here to here? It happens, but you don't see it. It's not in the visible spectrum. So this is only the ones we can see because we're using our eye to detect it. But there's lots of these things that happen at energy levels, that energy such that they're in the infrared or the ultraviolet. So or x-rays. All, all the ones we can see drop back to the primary uh, dealers, to the primary orbit? Yeah, it's a little bit of a, a, bit of a white lie, but yes. Okay. <laughs> Not all of them. Sometimes it gives you x-rays when you go all the way down. So we're not seeing the x-rays. It could be, but you don't see them. It could be giving you ultraviolet, and you can't see those either. Okay. Now, back in the good old days when they used film, like actual film, like camera film, the, that stuff that used to be in cameras that you had to develop so you could actually see if you made a good picture, like not the digital thing, but actual film. When they actually had film, they would just put film in there, and the film would pick up the things that we couldn't see. So they made lines spectra from things, even though it was black and white, they knew the wavelengths, and they determined what the colors were from that. Yeah, so they, they were pretty tricky, those guys. Um, anyways. That's how they got the radioactive stuff in the first place, too. I think it was in the film. Yeah, yeah. Curves. Okay, so this is white light. This is like the sun. Hydrogen, helium, neon. And you notice how the lines look really different? <clears throat> a lot more transitions going on these. Why? Because they have a lot more electrons. Okay. A lot more electrons means a lot more possible transitions. And so you start to see things like this. Now, you don't always see it like that. That's not a generalism, but that's, in essence, why you're seeing it here. And a lot more transitions in the visible spectrum. Okay, so um, what's interesting is you'll see a lot of mercury today. When you're looking at a mercury lamp, you get to look at the mercury lamp. The guys that were in lab this morning, did you ever recognize that the lights that are above us are filled with mercury? And that if you look at those lights you actually see the mercury spectrum from the lights that are above us. Okay, so you guys in the afternoon can enjoy that, I guess. Kind of a weird thought. That's why you don't throw uh, fluorescent light bulbs in the trash. You have to recycle them a certain way. Or you're not supposed to. Okay, so we have orbits. We have a nucleus. We have energy levels. This is the Bohr model. <coughs> it was really good at calculating what wavelengths you would see from hydrogen. As long as it had one electron, <laughs> it works. It turns out when you have two electrons, it doesn't work anymore. So Bohr's model was limited. Your book says, uh, what did it say? I thought it was pretty funny. That's yeah, if, 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 if it was great that it predicted hydrogen. It failed to predict the emission spectra of other elements that contained more than one electron. How many elements is that? It's all of them except hydrogens. So it didn't work. But it predicted, so they knew that this was the basis of what was called 
the quantum mechanical model. But what his big step was is he quantized. He figured out why the light energy was quantized, only certain levels that were seen, the line spectra. That was his big contribution. Okay, so let's skip over to this. Where'd it go? Oh, did I miss the baseball picture one? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, anybody who know, know who this is? Mark McGuire. I'm like, what? They couldn't find a newer picture. And then he wasn't even in Oakland. I mean, you know, this is like after. Anyways, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so, so here's, here's the idea. Okay. One of the problems that they realized with the way they were dealing with the electron is they were treating it as a particle in an orbit, like a planet around the sun. And a lot of evidence came up that said, oh, well, electrons, and this is what I was talking about before. This, was a, this is an electron, actually, a sharp marker, a dry erase marker. This was an electron. As we got to atomic sizes and you were looking at it, it would become less particle-like and more fuzzy, more wave-like. And that's what they were realizing, that the Bohr model did take into account that fuzziness of the electron as part of its real nature. Okay. So what they, the way they like to, and so this is a description of what's known as a probability map. Uh, I have a better one, I think, but I'll tell you what it is in a second. The idea that the book gives you for a probability map is like when the pitcher pitches a baseball, and this guy, if see, Mark McGuire sees the strike zone, right? There's a probability that he's using. He's determining that the ball will probably come here, and then he just swings through that spot. Okay? But it could be he's fooled, and the ball goes out here, or it goes out here, out here, and it becomes a strike. Okay? So the idea of a probability map is where you most expect to find the electron. So here's my idea of a probability map. I'm going to draw this for you, and I'm going to see if you guys can figure out a puzzle. Okay? So I'm going to draw my living room for you. And this was before I got hard, hardwood floors. So I had this TV. And this is a long time ago. The TV's not even here anymore. TV over here. Fireplace over here. And I had a coffee table here. And a sofa there. Okay? And I had carpet. Hardwood, uh, the linoleum started here, so this is carpet over here. And the refrigerator is over here. It's funny how you know you remember these things, right? Okay, so, you're not supposed to eat and watch TV in my house. It's one of those rules. No, eat, no electronics and food at the same time. Because if you're going to sit down, you're going to eat. You're going to eat with your family. And we're going to talk about things. You might talk about a video game, but you're not going to play a video game. So if you look around the table, this is the table, what do you expect to find? Well, there's no children. If there's no children in the room, right, there's still, like, stuff all over the floor. There's, like, smudges like this. And there's smudges like this. And there's actually a sliding door, and there's like a track like this, and this is the refrigerator, and there's tracks like this. Now, there's no children in the room, but I could tell you, tell me where the children were walking with food. <laughs> right? This is where the kids were walking and sitting in front of the TV when they're not supposed to... This is before that rule, actually, but... Yeah, they're wa sitting here, they're sitting on the table, right? They're watching TV and spilling food on the ground, and you say, who ate food in the living room? They're like, you're a genius. You weren't even home all day. And you know that we, of course I do, because I see all this stains all over my carpet that I have to clean up now, right? This is a probability map. And I can tell where they spend the most time because that's where the most junk is spread around on the floor. That makes sense? Yes. So that's a probability map. So an electron has a probability map too, okay? And so let me draw it for you, and then I'll tell you how we describe it. So here's the nucleus. It's positive, right? And the electron is negative. So the way it's done is they do it by shading. Okay? Now, the, the, the book is showing all these dots, okay? But the dots is what you get before the shading. It's going to look like this. 
and then it's going to look like this, and it's going to look like this, and then it's going to look like this. All right? And what happens is, is if you look in this, there's a lot of probability of finding the electron here because it's real dark, just like my carpet stains are really dark, right? And then it gets lighter and lighter and lighter as you move away. And the reason for that is the electron has a negative charge. The proton, the nucleus, is a positive charge, and it's attracted to the nucleus. So the place where you expect, just like the TV, the TV was the nucleus for all of this, right? So where you expect to find the children is mostly around the nucleus in this atom. So that's generally what these things look like, or were perceived to look like. Now, it turns out, to do this, they treat the electron as a wave. Um, let's see. And I'll give you some idea of kind of what these waves look like. Um, I'm going to draw another picture here. Let me just do this real quick. I'll just make another blank one. So this is the so this is X, right? And this is uh, density. We'll call it density. Density is how dark the color is. If this is the nucleus, and you move away from the nucleus, right? Where is the density on this going to be the highest for the electron? Where do you expect to find it the most? close to the middle, to the nucleus. And so it's going to be like this, and then it's going to drop off like that. So that's one of the ideas of how the electron behaves around the nucleus. But then there's this weird thing that happens when you treat an electron as a wave. And I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to try to show it to you on the computer. I don't know if it'll record well on Doceri, so I'm going to discard that. And I'm going to open up a video. Let's see if it shows up okay. I'm trying to. Re I'm going to try to record this video onto the talk, uh, but I'm not sure it's going to like me very much. Okay, hang on. I'm going to start here. Way out here. All right, so um, maybe it's back here. Oh, there it is. You see that? See how they're circular? All right. So where this is moving in the middle, that's the high density region. And this, this particular map, if I was drawing on it, would be high in the middle, like uh, here. Let me choose a different color. Hang on. It would be high. So here's my X. Here's my Y. It would be high in the middle. And it's actually doing this. But that is a, that's a wave. right? It's actually described by like a sine wave, but it's a, it's a modified one, like sine and cosine. right? This is where the density is the highest. Then the density gets to be very low here, and then, or low here, actually. There's some density here. It's high here, low here. Okay, so what you're seeing is what a wave for an electron actually looks like. But you see it all the time when you take like a coffee cup and it vibrates and you see the motion of the liquid up and down on the surface. That's a, very much the way we project what an electron looks like, except for this is two-dimensional, okay, where an electron is three-dimensional and it's around a three-dimensional atom. So the waves, instead of going up and down like this on a surface, they're going like this. Okay? They're going in and out from the nucleus. And that's what the wave of the electron kind of looks like. So, but this is one of the weird, here's the weird thing. Let's see if it'll show up. Okay. I'm going to go back to the beginning of this. Because this is the same teacup, okay? So I was in England. And uh, actually, I was in Ireland going to Wales and on my way to on a boat, and the boat was vibrating. And that's what's making this cup vibrate. Look at all the other wave patterns you see. Um, if I turn the lights off, that'd be better. See the patterns? Uh, there, that's where we were in the video, circular. 
And watch, you're going to make clover leaves shaped. There's two, and then it's going to make four here. And four might have been, four is at the beginning. So it make two, and then it has four as well. If you go all the way to the beginning of this video. Oh, great. Just stop playing it. Wait, the coffee. Wait, function in a coffee cup. There's the four. And it goes, it's briefly two again, but it goes back to this four. So that's actually, because we treat the electron as a wave in a confined space, that's how we have to treat the electron with multiple shapes. It's not just circles anymore. And that's one of the things that came out of this quantum mechanical theory, that the electron behaves like you expect it. You expect a sphere for an electron around the atom, because in our heads we all thought electrons were spheres, but it turns out the electron, is the shape is a little bit more complicated than that. And all of those things you can see if you just like watch a copy. I had seen that before, so I was kind of expecting it to happen on the, on the ship. The first time I saw it was in a coffee cup yeah, when I was at UC Santa Cruz, just driving down the hill. And all of a sudden I see this, my coffee cup and the, the waves on the surface. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Of course, I'm driving, right? So I'm looking down. This. Yeah. And now, I, then I realized I could record it much later in life, so I recorded it. That was good. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Nice to meet. Yeah, if you can ever take, if you ever get to England, and you can take the ferry from Wales, from uh, Ireland, Dublin, Ireland, to Wales, and it takes a train to uh, London. It's cheap. It's cheaper than flying. Way cheaper than flying. It's really, it's a cruise, basically. And they have free food and all kinds of good stuff, so. Sorry. Sound like a travel agent. Okay. So what do these shapes look like? Okay. Well, um... For one of the orbitals, now that we call these things orbitals, uh, this is the density map for the electron. It looks like this. Well, this is what we expect an atom to look like. I mean, you have your x, your y, and your z. So this is three-dimensional. That's a sphere made up of dots, okay? And so when you draw it in, well, you fill it in, and you shade it the way I was doing with that earlier one, this is what it looks like. It looks like we expect an atom to look like. This is actually known as an S orbital. That's the little blurb that's right there. There's other orbitals at high, this is for energy level one, n equals one, all right? That's what it looks like. Turns out when you go to n equals 2, remember I talked about in the Bohr model, you start at n equals 1, then you go to n equals 2. Because there's more energy, you can divide space up more ways. Okay. So, uh, hang on. So at energy level 1, this is what it looks like. They call that an S orbital because it's spherical. Actually, that's not why, but anyways. We call it spherical. Um, the S stands for something else. Uh, a 2S, just like energy level 2 is further away, right? It's just bigger. It looks exactly the same, but it's bigger, okay? But it turns out because there's more energy here, there's other orbital shapes. Just like when the coffee cup was vibrating on the table, right? Or the tea cup was vibrating on the table. It split it up more ways. This is some of the other ways, so I don't know if you saw it, but you actually, this was one of the ones that was in the video with high and low on each end of the center of the cup. So these are known as P orbitals. And it turns out there's three, electro, uh, three different P orbitals on each energy level that it has P orbitals. Okay. Now... What do I want you to remember? One, two, right? One S, two S, two P, and their shapes. So for the one S and the two S, they're spheres, okay? For the two P, we call them dumbbell shaped. 
Although, honestly, have you ever seen a dumbbell that looks like that? I don't think so. Anyways, this is, this is what scientists think a dumbbell looks like. How's that? So that's dumbbell shaped, right? And there's three of them, and they each go on a different axis, x, y, and z. And you might be asking, well, how did they know they're on x, y, and z? Turns out when the electrons are in the orbitals, they have a magnetic field, and you can make them line up x, y, and z, and you can actually see them and the different orbitals, okay? So it's not arbitrary. X, Y, and Z seems pretty arbitrary because it's an atom floating in space, but if you put it in a magnetic field, you can actually see the difference between X, Y, and Z. So they're perpendicular. They're perpendicular. They're at right angles to each other, okay? Now, it turns out if you had three, two, one S and two S, there's also a three S. This goes on forever, actually. It goes, it's infinite series um, kind of thing. What do you think a three S looks like? It looks like a 2s, right? It looks like a 1s, but it's bigger, right? So that's the thing I want you to know. It's bigger, right? And there's also a, there's a 2p. There's also a 3p. What do you think the 3p looks like in relationship to the 2p? Bigger. <laughs> and the electrons, what it means is the electrons on average are further from the nucleus when they're in that orbital. Okay, so. Is the, is the 3s? Larger than the 3P? Uh, yeah. I think, I think so. it should be a little bit bigger, yeah. Because it sits inside of it. Yeah. Oh, you know what the weird thing is? These are not very well drawn. Like, if they actually drew them the way they look, okay, and this is one of my things I don't like about this kind of drawing, they let artists draw them, and so artists make them look cool, but they are not quite realistic. If you take these three and you put them all together... Right? They make a sphere. It doesn't look like it the way it is here, but they actually occupy a lot more of the space out here. They're more like the like, you know the uh, you know the mushroom in Super Mario. Yeah. Right. Everybody knows the mushroom from Super Mario. Big fat top with the little bottom. The this looks like the fat top of a Super Mario mushroom. And then it's like a a ball, half a ball here and half a ball here. That's why when you take all three and you put them together, one X, one Y, and one Z, right, like this, that makes a ball. Okay. Okay. If you don't know what the Super Mario mushroom is, you're okay at life. It kind of looks like a mushroom. Give it that. Okay, oh, shoot, hang on. Yeah, so I'm going to throw one more picture in. This is the one that you saw towards the end of that video, how it split it up into four spaces. There, because, but it's three-dimensional, so there's a 3D orbital, and they all look kind of like clover leaf shape, like a four-leaf clover, except for that one weirdo, right? Yeah, that one. And they call this the dumbbell through a donut, because it kind of looks like a dumbbell shoved through a donut. Like this torus, this part, is a donut shape around the middle, and this is like the P orbital, except for it's stuck through the donut now. And again, when you take all these shapes, and you draw them realistically, and you put them all together, they make a sphere. They take up all the space around the atom. It's, it's perpendicular to itself, but it's cocked around 45 degrees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, this one is in the Y. So I was going to not try to explain too much of this, but this was in the YZ plane. So this one is supposed to be flat, like on this plane. But the other one, the, 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 yeah. the X, Y over here, the second one is closer to... Because that's an illusion because it's laid across the x-axis. Yeah, so this one is, sorry, this one is this way. It's that's between right. y and z. This one is in x, y, so it's in the x, y plane. Right. This is the x, z, so it's this way. Yeah. yeah, so, and then this one is the one that's flat yeah. on x and y. And the only thing different is that it's, it's orbitals, lobes, they're called lobes. We don't need to know that, I don't think. But the lobes are on the axes. Okay. Anyways. So this, this is how it works, though. There's also F. And I don't have a good illustration for F. F looks like a chrysanthemum, if you've ever seen it. It's got all these little flower-like ends on it, split up into lots and lots of spaces. And they're all three-dimensional and very complicated. We'll leave it at that. Uh, if you took my 1A class, I would teach you how to figure out what it was, but we're not going to do that. Okay. So, so here, here's energy level 1, energy level 2, 3, and 4. Right? And you notice what happens. Every time you go up in an energy level, you can add another orbital type. 
But the only difference between these S orbitals, at least superficially looking at from the outside, they're just bigger. And these P orbitals, superficially, what's bigger? Right, it's bigger. And this one is bigger. And there's a there's a 5F, 6F, 7F. Just goes on. There's actually a G orbital. Right? So if you did S, P, D, F, and then after that it's alphabetical. G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N. They don't talk about those because you don't see them on the periodic table. Turns out all of these, you can see their influence on the, or, on the organization of periodic table. Okay. And I'll talk about that. That's going to be an important aspect of doing what we call electron configurations. Okay. So we're going to learn something. It's called the electron configuration. And it's a fancy word for how the electrons are arranged in an atom by energy levels. Okay. So this is the orbital for hydrogen. This is hydrogen. It is the smallest atom, right? How many? Turns out hydrogen, because it's the smallest atom, has the lowest energy level orbitals filled, or half filled at least. And so you have atomic number one, right? So hydrogen has Z equal to one. And 1s is the lowest orbital energy level. And you put 1 in here, right? That's uh, a, how do I say it? The electron in the lowest energy level, that's the, what we call the ground state electron. Now, if you took hydrogen and you put energy into it, it could go up to a higher orbital. It could go up to, for example, to a 2p or a 3d or anything like that, and it could come back down and give off light, okay? So when we do electron configurations, right, you're going to write the orbitals, and you're going to put electrons in the orbitals. Now, here's the thing. Every orbital can hold at most two electrons, Okay, so we can do helium, because that 1s orbital is not full. It only has one, right? So where's helium on the periodic table, right? It's right here. It has two electrons, right? So if I'm writing the orbital, or the energy diag uh, sorry, electron configuration for, there's too many words. The electron configuration for helium, I would just say 1s2. Now that one's full, okay? So if I want to do another electron, okay, it has like three electrons, like lithium has three electrons. I can't put it in the 1s energy level because that one's full, so I have to put it into the 2s, okay? Remember, the way they go is 1s is the lowest in energy, then bigger than that's 2s. Turns out bigger than that is 2p. So if you think about what I was talking about in terms of the orbitals, right? let's make a little note from the side here. 1s was the lowest in energy. Then it was 2s. But next to 2s, there's also two p's. And we drew them all on the same line. But they're actually a little bit higher in energy. So we would say they're like two p's like that. And they're probably just a smidge larger, but not much. And it's only larger actually in things with more than one electron, which is everything except hydrogen. Okay, so 3s would be here, and then 3p would be here, right? And then 3d would be here at this level. Now, I'm going to tell you what, I'm doing something here. I'm coding this a little bit, okay? There's one orbital. How many p orbitals were there? 
There were three, x, y, and z, right? So these are the x, y, and z orbitals. There's three orbitals in here. How many orbitals were in the d's? If you count them, look back at the picture, right? There were five. So this is one, two, three, four, five. That's five orbitals. You see the pattern? It's one, three, five. What do you think the f's have? Seven. So f would be up here somewhere, and I could draw it like this. And there would be seven slots here. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So every time you do this, the number of orbitals increases by two to give you an odd number again. Now, what did I say about orbitals and how many electrons they can take? They can only take two, right? So how many can I get here? Two, right? How many can I get here? This is two. How many can I get in all of these together? Six, okay? This would be six. This would be two. How about here? Ten. And here? Fourteen. Okay, so here I'm going to show you something on the periodic table. Because I like the Bible. There's a lot of stuff that's not useful in what we're in the, it's in the book. It's real confusing. Uh, but I want to show you something on the periodic table. How many columns here? Two, right? Corresponds to S orbitals. How many columns here? Two, four, six. Corresponds to P orbitals. So the structure of the periodic table is based on how the orbitals are split amongst the different energy levels. How many do you see here? Count these up. It's kind of hard to count from the distance. There's 10, right? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So what orbitals are these? It's going to be the d orbitals because you can have 10 electrons in a d orbital. Now here's the cool thing, right? This turns out to be 3D. It's kind of, I'll have to explain that to you when I get to, get to it. This is a 3D orbital here. Scandium has one electron in the 3D orbital. Titanium has two electrons in the D orbital. Vanadium, how many do you think it has? Three electrons in its D orbital. So you're actually, remember the electron configuration is the way we describe how electrons are organized in the atom, okay? But it's actually telling us, if you look at the periodic table, it's telling us the electron configuration of that atom. Okay. How many do you think are down here, by the way? 14. There should be 14 because it's 2, 6, 10, and 14. If you count it, right? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. So those all, these guys all use f orbitals. These transition, so these are the inner transition, transition metals all use d orbitals at the end. And then group 1 and group 2, A, right, those are S. And group 3 through 8A use P. Okay? So we're going to go ahead and start doing electron configurations. Uh, we'll do it first, just counting electrons and filling orbitals, and then we'll do it off the periodic table. Okay, And then we'll see how that works out. Um, I'll get to this in a second. So I'm going to make a blank sheet here. So I'm going to make a table, and we're just going to do a whole bunch of them. Okay, so you guys get the feel for it. Oh, she started drinking already. <laughs> Sorry. This looks really like confusing and hard. But once you get the hang of it, it's just one of those things that'll be relatively easy, okay? Yeah, but I think I need a drink, too. It's really humid in here. I have, a, I have a question. I was previously taught that the I was taught shells. Yeah. And that your first shell has two, and yeah. then all the others have eight. Is that just an old concept? Or? That's a Bohr model thing. Okay. Yeah. And... That's a convenient way. So the convenient way is to say 2, right, then sit 8, right. and then 8, and then 18, and 18, and then, you know, 18 plus 14, 36, or whatever. That's, yeah. 
it's hard to do it that way once you get past like the first two rows. So we're going to do helium. Okay, now I need to write that a little bit bigger. Draw helium. How many elect? So this is going to be the atom. This is going to be the electrons. This will be the electron configuration. Okay. So we'll do helium. How many electrons does it have? Two, right? The order for the electron configuration, the orbitals always go 1s. 2s, 2p. What I'm doing is I'm following it this up. Okay? So 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p. So we're going to stop there and we're going to do those and then we'll do some of the other ones because it, it's a little bit confusing. Okay? 2p, 3s, and 3p. That's always the order. And remember, you can get 2 in the s's and you can get 6 in the p's. Okay? So to do the electron configuration for helium, since I only have to worry about two electrons, because it only has the two that are here, the electron configuration would be written as just 1s2. And both those electrons are in that 1s orbital together. Okay. So we're going to do the next um, element. We'll do lithium. How many electrons? Three. It's the next one, right? So I go 1s2. Well, that takes care of two of the three. I have one more to place. So where does it have to go? Well, in the ground state, the next lowest energy level that's available is this one. So you would write 2s, and then what do you put? One, because that adds up to three, right? Um, let's do beryllium just for fun. That's number four. Okay, so it's going to go 1s2, then what? 2s2. And then we're going to do uh, boron. So that's five, right? What is that going to be? 1s2, 2s2. And then what's next? 2p, yeah. 2p, how many? One, because that adds up to five. Okay. So what really you have to remember is this order, but then it turns out if you can just remember the periodic table, that order is going to come right off the periodic table. There's not a 1p. What's that? There's not a 1p. And there's not a 1p, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and look, 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 look. Right? 1s. This is 1s2, two, right? This is 2s1. That's how it ends. So look at the 2s1 up there, right? And then beryllium is 1s2, 2s2. You notice it's in the second column of this group. This is known as, actually got, is known as the s block. Because the electron configuration of all these elements ends in S1 or S2, depending on if it's in group 1 or group 2. Where's boron? It's over here, right? And you notice it ends in what? P, and it's P1, right? Now carbon would be, guess what? P2, and nitrogen would be P3. 2P3. 2P3, yeah. I'm leaving the two off. I'm just saying the two. The, okay, that's what I'm yeah. okay. And this is 2P. What is it? Well, you can what count it. Nitrogen? 1, 2, 3, 4. It's 2P4. This is 2P5. And this is 2P6. So let's just write neon. Or actually, yeah, let's do ne nitrogen. Let's do nitrogen first. But there's only 3P. Yeah, there's only 2 and 2s, two because that's all the electrons. It turns out, for like other reasons, that's the only, that's the maximum amount you can get in an orbital. You can have more in the p orbitals, because there's three in every energy level. Okay, so like 2p is actually three different orbitals. 
the x, y, and the z one. Okay, so that's where you can get more. So, so here, all right, we filled this one up here. So if you're doing lithium, you have an extra electron. It has to go up to here. Here, right, you filled up this one, so it has to go into the next one. And the order of the energy levels, I just wrote it out here. Okay. This is actually known, it's got this name. I always thought it was somebody's name name, called the Aufbau Principle. Sounds really fancy, right? Aufbau. Aufbau literally means the filling order. So this is the filling order principle. I'll write that out for you. I thought there was some guy named Aufbau. Yeah. It's German. Yeah, right? Okay, so we're going to do nitrogen, right? So nitrogen has how many electrons? Seven, right? So I'm going to, we're going to keep going until we get there. One, S, two, two, S, two, two, P. And I need to get to seven, so how many needs to be there? Three. And you can get that, again, from the periodic table just by counting one, two, three. It's the third column in the P block, okay? Let's do phosphorus. How many electrons in phosphorus? 15, so we've got to do a little bit more work here, right, because it's a lot of arithmetic. 1s2, 2s2, 2p. How many can I get in a p? 6. That's 10. At, so I'm not there yet. Wait till you do something like lead, and it's got 82. That's going to suck for you. You'd be like, I'm just going to miss that one, right? Would it be like 3G? Or like no. 3G, yeah. 3G. For, for, for lead? You'll end, where, 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 what will lead end in? P2. And it turns out, did you notice, right? Nitrogen ends in 2P3, right? What period is it in? 2. Phosphorus is in energy level three, right? Three P, so we do phosphorus, we're gonna go two P six, and then we're into three S two, and then how many more do I need? Three, three P three. And you notice that there's nitrogen and there's phos uh, phosphorus, right? They're right on top of each other in the periodic table. They're in the same family of elements or same group. They have the same ending on their electron configuration, except for phosphorus is bigger, so it's one energy level down or up, if you want to look that way. So how do you know how you put, uh, after the 3S2, how do you know you can put 2 instead of 1 or instead of 3? Yeah, 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 so first, there's two, two ways to do it, okay? Two ways to do it. One is you have to count all the electrons. Because the total number of electrons has to add to be 15. So if you do this, that's 2 and 3. That's 5 more plus the 10. That's the 15. But the way to do it from the periodic table is if you look here, right? This is the, so if you start with this as the 1, this is 2, and this is 3. This is 3P3. This is 3P4. And lead, you could do actually really fast if I showed you the shortcut. I'm not going to yet. But it's going to end in 6, right, P2. So you know that it's going to end that way. Everything else before it is full. So you could actually write them all out and put the maximum number into each one. And then when you get to this one, that's not going to be the maximum number. It's just where it is in the periodic table. Let's do... Uh, so, so you notice, uh, we're going we're gonna to do this, calcium. And I guess I will show you the shortcut, because I'm starting to feel sorry for you guys having to write so much. Because nobody writes this much. We all learn the shortcut, and then after that, we're like, oh, there's a shortcut. Right? Okay, what's the Nobel gas before calcium? Argon. How did I get that, or how did he get that? He's backed up, 20, 19, 18, argon, okay? So we're going to do calcium. It has 20 electrons in it. 
But rather than write out the whole electron configuration, you make a bracket and you put in argon. That represents the first 18 electrons. So now you just need two more. <laughs> so now you can write four S2. So when you go to do lead, you don't write everything all the way down to lead. You find where lead is. You look at the noble glass that's closest to it. You put it in brackets and you say it's XE. And then you finish it. Okay? I have to teach you a little bit more before we do that. <clears throat> How do you know to do the four? How do I know to do the four? What four? The four, four. Oh. One, two, three, four. And it turns out so the energy levels right, are represented, we called them periods, right? but they're actually the energy levels for the S and P orbitals. So you don't, like, really, you don't have to, that order that I wrote up there on the previous slide, you don't have to remember that. You just have to remember what this is. Oh, that's 5S. So rubidium, right? If I'm doing this, or francium, let's do francium way down here, right? You want to do this electron configuration. So you got to write the, all the electrons before energy level 7. So you got to go, go to radon, Rn. Oh, by, by the way, it's 88 or uh, 87. Right? Nobody wants to add to 87. So then you're going to put Rn. That represents 86 electrons. Assuming all the other stuff before it's full, okay, and then what energy level is it on? Seven. And then it's S1. Still have questions? You have questions? You okay? So why didn't you go from 3S, 3P, and 3D? Ah. So that's one of those technical details about. So, so the question is a very good question. Because um, you, you'll notice that everything I did before I jumped all the way to the end like that was 1s, 2s, 3s. Yeah. And then when you do 4, the three, I did 4s, but where did the 3d go? Right? Because you would think 3s, 3p, 3d, right? So it turns out the way these energy levels are spaced, I'm going to redraw it off to the side here. The way these energy levels are, actually, you don't draw it up here. So let's call that 1s. This is uh, 2s. 2p goes like this, a little bit higher. And the reason it's a little bit higher is when you have extra electrons in there, x, y, and z are all a little bit different than just the S. They have, you, you added three, you divided it into three spaces and that turns out to make the energy higher. So then you do 3S, right? And then you do 3P. And then you do 3D. Be, be, the yeah, the energy level for a 3P versus a 3S is different when you have more than one electron in a system. And it turns out if you take space, a little more complicated when I get into it, but if you take space or any, any wave and you divide it up into more waves, that's increasing the frequency of the wave and you get higher energy. So if you think now, through, that's on a stream. Like I have a wave that goes, I have a wave that looks like this. And then I divide it into more spaces. That's essentially doing this, okay? That's a higher frequency, that's higher energy, okay? So it turns out if you do that same thing in three dimensions, so a S is a sphere, but a P orbital divides the space up into three spaces, that's adding more waves to it. That's higher in energy. You do the same thing with the, a d orbital that divides up into more space, so that's higher in energy. So what ends up happening 
is this energy level is going up like this, and it turns out just below that is 4s. And the electrons always fill the lowest energy orbital first. And since these happen to be a little bit lower in energy than those, not by much, because it turns out there's little things like if you add an electron or take an electron away, it turns out that order will switch back the way you expect it to sometimes. Like you expect it to be 3s, 3p, 3d, and you'll get that if you, for example, take the electron out or something. So it is so close, okay, that it does switch around. But in the ground state, when all the electrons are in their lowest possible energy, this part of the periodic table that's actually energy level three. That's where the three Ds went. These, then, this is three, this is four, this is five, and this is six, even though it's in the seventh period. Okay? So S's and P's go with the periods. The Ds are one less, and it turns out the F's are two less. Okay, so I'm going to do a couple. I'm not going to do F's, but I'll do some Ds because you have to, you're expected to know how to do D orbitals. But the F orbitals... You know how the energy levels get really close? They do kind of weird things all throughout because they're actually these energy levels, the way I drew them up here, I drew them sort of evenly spaced. They get closer and closer together as you go further away. And that's a Coulomb's law thing. Okay. So you literally can just look at which period it's in and that's the energy level? For the S and P's. Oh. And, for the, and for the D's, it's one less. So uh, we're going to do uh, main, let's do iron just for fun. So let me do this real quick. I'm going to get rid of all this I just drew down here. Wow, that's weird. Hang on. I'm going to get rid of all of it. There we go. So we're going to do iron. Okay. And iron has how many electrons? 26, right? What's the Nobel gas core for it? What would you use? AR, argon. You always go to the Nobel gas. You don't go to, the, like, the S orbital or anything. It's always the Nobel gas, okay? So it's the same. The core, what we call the core of it, the middle of it, is the same as calcium. And then what's this? All right. Yeah, so this is 4, right? So this is the S's. So I'm going to write 4S2. Because this is 4S. And iron is over here, right? So this is now 3D. And if you count, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6... It's got 6D electrons. And that would be its configuration. Why is it now 3? It has to do with that whole spacing thing that I was talking about. When I had the levels drawn up there, it just oh. happens to be that 4S is lower in energy than 3D. So that switches. But that's the thing about the periodic table. That's the way it's organized. If this was not organized that way, right, then you would have expected all of these actually to be one up. But because the periodic table is like based on the electronic configurations, it has the same order as you expect from the orbital energy levels. It's just the way it is, I guess. So you have pretty much everything on the first column for us. Yeah. Everything on the last six. RLP. Yeah. Yeah, and they're always one energy level less than the period that they're on for the Ds. But everything else is exactly what it says it is. Okay. So if you wanted to do... Bless you, I think. That's a hiccup. Oh, well, then I take it back. I'm not blessing you for that. Gee. What? ZR would be a 4D because it's on energy. So let's, let's go ahead and do like... Palladium? Pal yeah, let's do one. I was actually going to do silver, but we could do palladium. Okay. <laughs> Can I do silver instead? Sure. It's next why? to it. Okay. I'll tell you why in a second. But So we're going to do 
P, uh, uh, sorry, we're going to do AG. Okay. Now, what's the core? Krypton. And just for fun, that's 36 electrons, right? And then silver is on this period here, right? So it's going to be 5s2 because that's going to be filled because you're going to have electrons all the way up to silver. So this has to be filled. So I wrote that down. And then it's 4d9. You know the fast way? How did you get it? Did you count actually all the way across? Yeah. 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 The, the fast way to do it, actually, when like you're over here, if you know there's ten, it's one less than ten, so it's nine. But yeah. But you know, it doesn't really matter because either way is pretty fast. So. So that's three. So let's add something up. So that's thirty-six and eleven. That's the forty-seven electrons that I was looking for. Just to make sure it all adds up, right? Check. Yes, my check that I did something okay. Now, the reason I didn't do palladium is remember I said how the energy levels are really close to each other? So it turns out for palladium, it's one of the exceptions to what we're doing right now, so that's why I didn't do it. Turns out it fills all the electrons in the Ds first and then doesn't do it. So it's, it's what you would expect. So that's why I didn't do it. So the way they know the configurations for all the ground states and like where there are exceptions and stuff like that is they actually use energy to uh, irradiate the samples and they measure the transition energies for the electrons. So that thing you did with the spectrometer today, they just do it with a very, very expensive one and they figure out how much energy was gained or lost by the electrons and so they know what orbitals they're in. So they actually measure it experimentally. So th what we're doing is just you know, what we expect to see from the periodic table, it's true about 98% of the time, about two, well, 95% of the time. There's about five or six exceptions. Yeah. In the part of the periodic table we use. Yeah. Down here, there's so many that I don't want to keep track of it anymore. Why did you use, what is that? Uh, I don't know. Proton instead of xenon? What, what is your method for that? Oh, yeah, yeah. So we did silver, right? Yeah. So the... Noble gas that is before it, well, this is 47, it's got to be this one. Okay, yeah, you always go to the previous noble gas. Okay, so that's electron configurations. Um, I'm going to teach you something called orbital diagrams, but we're going to take a break. So let's take a 10 minute break and then find coffee or something. I don't know. So the orbital diagram, let's say we're going to do one for argon, all right? We know the orbitals kind of go like this. This is 1s, that's 2s. I'm going to draw these next to each other. That's 2p. That's 3s, and that's 3p. Okay, and we know only two electrons can go in per orbital, right? So I'm going to fill all these up because argon, right, is at the very end of the 3p, so every one of those orbitals is going to have an electron in it. The way we designate electrons is by using little arrows like that. And that's different than that, okay? And I hate to say this, but it's called the electron spin. It's either spin up or spin down. And it turns out that electrons behave like magnets. They have a little magnetic field, and the magnetic field, when you Put it, an electron in a magnetic field will either orient with it or against it. And so we know that electrons have what are called little magnetic moments. They either point up north or they point south down. So if you take two electrons and you put them in an orbital, they can't have the same spin. Okay? So this is up, spin. And this is spin down. So the first one we usually draw in up, and then the next one has to be down, like that. And then this one goes up, and then this one goes down. And then the 2p orbitals, we fill them like this. So I put one, right? The next one goes like this. The next one goes like this. 
So I'm filling them in order, one per orbital, okay? Spinning the same way. And then when I go back through, I fill it by coming back like this. It's kind of like children in bedrooms, right? If you have five bedrooms and five children, <coughs> one child per bedroom a lot of times, right? And then what you end up doing is if you have six children, then two of them have to pair up. But it turns out they spin in different directions in these bedrooms. I don't know, it's weird. One's going up and one's going down. Okay. That would be like sleeping in the same bed and you're smelling your brother's feet all the time, which would be horrible. Oh, my God, teenage boys. Okay, I'm not done yet. Then it goes like this and this. So this would be the orbital. Sorry, I did it bad. I knew it was all going to fill up. But that's what it ends up looking like. And every arrow represents an electron, and two arrows cannot be pointed the same direction in any given orbital. Okay, so let me do um, phosphorus. So for phosphorus, uh, yeah, yeah, let's do phosphorus, why not? I have one S, two S. 2p, 3s, 3p. And I know I need to do that much because it's in energy level 3, it's in the p orbitals. That's, I know I have to go at least that far. And it has 15 electrons in it. So you can actually go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And the last three have to go separately. So they go like this, 1, 2, 3. That's 13, 14, and 15, okay? Just because they don't want to stay in the same room together, they separate and take, each take their own room, okay? Um, this is known as Hun's Rules, if your book has it in there. But basically, when you fill electrons into an orbital, Right? They always go separate before pairing up. Okay. Yeah, usually up. Yeah. If it's a multiple choice test, you won't get the option of drawing them up and down and up and down. They all have to go the same direction. Okay. But usually they draw them all up before they draw them down. Because... That's just what they do. You could actually draw them all down as long as they go in the same direction. Right. Yeah. All right. Concept, valence electrons, okay? Valence electrons are the electrons with the highest energy electrons, okay? That is in the highest energy level electrons of an atom. Valence electrons are the highest energy level electrons of an atom. Okay, so I'm going to do an electron configuration very quickly for, um, let's say, germanium. Okay. So we're in, in and uh, I'll just write it out. So my core is, you can kind of beat me, maybe argon. And there's 4s2, 3d10, and... 4p2. So this is germanium. Okay? This is my core. My valence electrons are the highest energy level electrons. So if you look at germanium's electron configuration, how many valence electrons does it have? How many? Two. Not a bad answer. Not the right answer, but not a bad answer. Four. Why not 14? Because this is the energy level. Okay. Yeah, it was three. And the fact that it's three, yeah, it's three versus four. Four is bigger. Highest energy level electrons, there's only four of them. 
Okay, so I'm going to teach you the quick way to do this. All right. Anytime you do valence electrons, okay? What group is germanium in? Uh, not 14. In the in the in the correct periodic table, it would be group four. A. The valence electrons is the group number. Because okay, it doesn't matter, like if you think about it, this is going to be 1, 2, and if you did 10, 3, 4, these wouldn't count, so it would still be 4. If you did iodine, it would be, right, 1, 2, don't count these, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, this is group 7A. So the quick way to do valence electrons is just look at the group that it's in. The only exceptions to that are the transition elements. They, all the transition elements have the same number of valence electrons. Because even if you put electrons in here, these are always higher in energy, so they all have two. Okay, technically, the way they do valence electrons, they all have two valence electrons. Um, yeah, we'll talk more about that later if I get the... I feel like I, we have time to do that, but I don't know if we have time to talk about that. Okay, so we have valence electrons. You can get it from the group number, 1A, 2A, 3A. So all the, like sodium, lithium, potassium, all group 1A, all right? All one valence electron. Beryllium, magnesium, calcium, all group 2A, all two valence electrons. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this. Tell me how many valence electrons chlorine has. Seven. Yeah, there you go. What's its electron configuration end in? 3P. What? Five. Five. Yeah. Good. So I'm going to skip that slide. Well, I'm not really skipping it. Skip all this. This is all stuff. This is the long explanation of valence electrons. Hmm. I'm not sure what's going on, but I seem to have lost connection. I think Wi-Fi just went down for a little bit. So let me...